<coughs> NMR spectroscopy, nuclear magnetic resonance. NMR stands for nuclear magnetic resonance. So this is one of several spectroscopic techniques that we've been covering so far. Okay. Uh, last semester we talked about infrared, just like uh, other spectroscopic techniques. The NMR is useful for specific purposes too. Remember the infrared was mainly used to determine the different types of functional groups that we have in a molecule. That was the primary use of infrared. You know, it could not give us any information about the connectivity of the atoms and stuff like that. Uh, UV visible was able to give us information about conjugated systems, if the systems were conjugated, meaning alternation of double and single bond and so on and so forth. But now with the air, NMR spectroscopy, it helps us identify the connectivity between atoms. That's what NMR spectroscopy is. How do we know that atom A is connected to atom B, which is connected maybe to atom C? That information is given to us by nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. So it's very useful to identify carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen frameworks. Okay, and um, this technique is, I think, well, I, uh, based according to me, is the most important of all the spectroscopic technique. You know, is the most important of all the spectroscopic technique for an organic chemist, because based on NMR, you can actually determine the structure of a protein. How do you know that a protein looks the way it looks like? NMR will be able to tell you that. How do you know that uh, benzene, the benzene ring, looks like this? NMR is able to tell you that. Does that make sense? NMR is able to tell you that. So it's very important. So in, under this uh, chapter, we'll talk briefly about the principle by which NMR functions. And most importantly, how do you interpret an NMR spectrum? That's what is more important. How do we interpret the NMR spectrum? How do I live from a spectrum to a proposed structure? Is that okay? Now, you remember what a nuclei is. What is a nuclei? What is a nuclei? It's a combination of... Yes, that's what a nuclei is. It's a combination of the proton and the neutron. Okay, that's why the nuclei is combination of a proton and neutron. So if you have nuclei with odd numbers of protons or odd numbers of neutrons or both of them are odd, those nuclei are referred to as NMR active nuclei, meaning that you can study them using NMR. Okay, they need to have odd number. So that already should ring a bell. If they have an odd number, it means that if you start pairing them, there will always be that one that will be standing alone. There's always that one that will be standing alone. Okay. And so because we only need to have odd numbers of protons or neutrons or both, there are only specific nuclei that can be studied using NMR. And so the hydrogen with only one proton can be studied using NMR. Carbon-13, remember carbon-13 is an isotope of carbon. Normally carbon is 12. Okay, with carbon-12, if you consider carbon-12, you will have 12 protons and probably 12 neutrons. And so in that case, you know, you cannot use NMR to study carbon-12. But you can use NMR to study carbon-13 because you have 13, uh, 13 neutrons in there. You have 12 protons, but... 13 neutrons. That's what carbon 13 is. And so because the number of neutrons is odd, then you can study carbon using NMR. So the same is true with nitrogen 15 instead of nitrogen 14, uh, fluorine and phosphorus. Okay. You can all be studying using NMR. Principle of NMR. How does it function? Uh, when we talk of this nuclear, the nuclei have what we call the spin. That's what the nuclei is. It contains a spin. Uh, 
how will I even the best way for me to represent that spin is if you think about the electron let's think about the electron we usually say the electron can either be uh, pointing up or pointing down you remember when you used to do electronic configuration so technically these are what we refer to as spin in the electron when an electron is pointing up we sometimes refer to that as a plus one half spin you've seen that you remember that in three in 201 and when the electron is pointing down we refer to it as a minus one half spin is that okay yeah, I think you guys remember it in 201. Now, uh, the nucleus also contains a spin, but it's not similar to the spin of the electron. It also contains a spin. But the problem with the nucleus is that the spin of the nucleus is not organized like the spin of the electron. It's random. And that's what we have over here. So when you have a molecule, any molecule or any atom, the spin of the nucleus there is just random. It's just random. And electrons are moving around the nucleus. Remember that. Electrons move around the nucleus. But the spin of those nucleus are basically random. When you apply an external magnetic field towards the nucleus, what it does, it organizes the spin. It arranges the spin. So over here, B0 represents an external magnet, external magnetic field. So when you apply that external magnetic field, those nuclear spins are now organized. Some of them will be aligned on the same direction as the magnetic field, and some of them will be aligned on opposite direction with the magnetic field. We don't care right now who is aligned with the magnetic field or who is not, but we know is that some of them will be aligned with the magnetic field and some of them will be opposite spin to that of the magnetic field. Does that make sense? Uh, the nuclei that align with the magnetic field are referred to as the alpha spin state and they are lower in energy. Does that make sense? So the nuclear spin that align with the magnetic field are called the alpha spin state and they are lower in energy. Whereas those who align against the magnetic field are referred to as the beta. So, alpha and beta. Are referred to as the beta spin state and they are high in energy. They are high in energy between the alpha and the beta. Yes? No, the beta is high energy compared to the alpha. The beta is in lower energy because it aligns itself with the magnetic field, whereas the beta is high energy because it's opposite to the applied magnetic field. Okay. Any questions so far? Now, you can have millions of nuclei. You can have millions of nuclei. So if you have millions of nuclei, Maybe out of a million, out of one million, out of one million nuclei, maybe only 20 of those will be in the beta state. Then the rest will be in the alpha state. Does that make sense? Like out of 100, after out of millions of nuclei, only about 20 will be in the beta state and the rest will be in the alpha state. Of course, that makes sense because the alpha state is the most stable state, you know. And that's why uh, NMR, the unit for measuring NMR is a part per million. We call that the PPM. That's the unit. We'll get to that. And so that comes from here, meaning that you can only measure for very, very little tiny amount. That's what we refer to as part per million. Okay. Does that make sense with the principle so far? We haven't got in there yet. We're still, we're still talking about that. Now, the energy difference between the alpha and the beta state is basically the principle of the enema. Okay? The energy difference. The energy difference now is also a function of the applied magnetic field. Remember I said you have an external magnetic field that separates the spins between the alpha and the beta state. Now, the gap 
between the alpha and the beta state is a function of the strength of your magnet. So if you have a very strong magnet, the energy difference between the alpha and the beta state is also large. Does that make sense? That's what we call delta E. If you have an instrument with a very strong magnet, the energy difference between the alpha and the beta state will be large. If you have an instrument with a weaker magnet, the energy difference between them will be a little bit slow, okay? Will be a little bit small. Well, I was, I was talking of magnet, but I was circling frequency. This is the magnet here, magnetic field. So we have a magnetic field of 7 and a magnetic field of 14. Tesla, that's a uniform magnetic field. Okay, so the separation between the alpha and the beta state is a function of the strength of your magnet. Over here at Hampton University, we have a 400 megahertz instrument. So that's what we have here on campus, which is really nice. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's very good. That's, uh, that's really nice. So how does the NMR spectroscopy work? How does the instrument function? Uh, when you apply a magnetic field on the spin, it separates, it separates them into two, the alpha and the beta state. But then, you now send in a radio frequency wave, RF. You send in a radio frequency wave. Remember, radio frequency is a region of the electromagnetic spectrum. When we did eye infrared, we were using infrared light. So you have your sample, and then you shine infrared light. It will cause the molecule to vibrate, and that vibration is what is recorded. When you were doing UV spectroscopy, you were using the UV portion of the electromagnetic spectrum to shine on your molecule, and that will cause electrons to vibrate and change energy level. And when the electrons fall back to the energy level, they emit the same amount of energy they absorb. And that's what you record as your UV spectrum. Does that make sense? So in infrared, you go towards the radio frequency side of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so when your magnet separates the spins into two, you now send in a pulse of radio frequency. Okay? So when you send in that pulse of radio frequency, it goes in there and then charge up your nuclei, you know, give energy to the nuclei, especially the nuclei in the alpha state. When the nuclei in the alpha state receive enough energy, it changes spin. So it flips, it becomes beta now. So it's that motion, when that nuclei is leaving from the alpha state to the beta state, that signal is now sent to the instrument. And that's what we record as your NMR spectrum. Does that make sense? So it's the energy, the radio frequency energy absorbed. And in other words, you know, at that moment we say the nuclei is in resonance with your radio frequency. When the nuclei is in resonance with the radio frequency, it spins. And that spinning is what is observed on the spectrum. That's why we call it magnetic resonance. Magnetic because you use a magnet to order the spins. And then the resonance because you want those spins now to resonate with your radio frequency. Does that make sense? Okay, that's the working principle of the enemy. And so, the energy difference, just like what we said, the energy difference between the two spins is a function of your applied magnetic field. B0 is the applied magnetic field. H is uh, the Planck constant. H is your Planck constant. Uh, gamma is another constant. We call that the gyromagnetic constant. Gamma is another constant. It's called the gyromagnetic constant. And the value depends on the type of nuclear. So, uh, protons. Remember, when I mean proton, what I mean by proton is a hydrogen atom, okay? Uh, because it can use interchangeably. The proton has a, spe a specific value for its gyromagnetic. Carbon also has a specific value. So the value of the gyromagnetic depends on the type of, uh, of uh, system, I mean, type of atoms you have. Okay. 
So here we have a um, schematic representation of how your NMR works. So basically, the way the instrument works, uh, you have huge poles of magnets over there in your instrument. You know what the magnet is. And you have a tube, tiny tube, where you fit in your sample. So you fit in the sample, you place the sample on the magnetic field, and then you're now sending the pulse of radio frequency. So those yellow lines are the radio frequency. You're sending the pulse of the radio frequency to cause the, uh, the spins to resonate. And when those spins resonate, they are now detected and then sending into the computer for interpretation. And by magic, the computer now prints out the spectrum for you. Yes. That's called what? That magic is called the Fourier transform. That's the name of the magic. So through Fourier transform, it now prints out the, the spectrum for you now to interpret. Okay? That's basically how it works. <laughs> now we'll spend a lot of time talking about proton enema, meaning hydrogen enema. That's what we'll spend a lot of time talking about. Then we'll also talk about carbon and the rest. Now, all hydrogen in a compound do not experience the same magnetic field. Okay? All hydrogens in a compound do not experience the same magnetic field. And so because those hydrogens do not experience the same magnetic field, that's how you are able to distinguish them. That's how now you are able to say that, okay, this hydrogen will be placed here according to its own magnetic field, and this hydrogen will be placed on this portion of the molecule based on its own type of magnetic field. Does that make sense? And so, and so, the effective magnetic field that a nuclei feels is a function of the applied magnetic field and that of the local magnetic field. We'll explain what that local magnetic field is. Okay? Because everything depends on the nuclei. The effective magnetic field that um, a nuclei actually feels is a function of the applied magnetic field, which is what your instrument gives out. For example, the instrument we have here is a 400 megahertz instrument. So, I don't know, 400 megahertz, maybe it will produce around 8 8 tesla the strength of that magnetic field about 8 tesla but the nuclear will not receive all the eight the nuclear will receive something based on what the local magnetic field is remember on an atom let me repeat what we did in high school if you have an atom in the middle of the atom you have the nucleus meaning the nucleus and the proton that's the nuclear with its own spin here that nuclear has its own spin and that nuclear is surrounded by who? Electrons. You remember that? You have the nucleus, and then the nucleus is surrounded by electrons. That's why we were told, right? The way things are. Okay? And what's the charge of the electron? Negatively charged. Electron is negatively charged. The electron is negatively charged. And the electron is moving around. The electron is moving. Uh, when an electron moves, what happens? When electron physics, in physics, what did you guys learn in physics? Say that again. I heard someone say, what is current? When electron moves, it generates current, right? This current that we use, electricity, is just because electrons are in motion. When electron move, it generates current. And when you generate current, what happens? You generate a magnetic field. Does that make sense? So when the electrons move, they generate a certain amount of current. And that current also generates a magnetic field. That's why if you talk to people, Virginia, energy, power, and whatsoever, if you go in front, you might feel some attraction because the current that it generates actually produces a magnetic field also. You have a magnetic field. Whenever an electron move, it produces a magnetic field. And that magnetic field produced by the electron is what we refer to as the local magnetic field. Does that make sense? So there is a magnetic field generated by the electrons that surround the nucleus. Does that make sense? There is that magnetic field generated by the electron around the nucleus. That's what surrounds the nucleus. 
And so you now send in your applied magnetic field. You send in your applied magnetic field, which I will call BA. What the applied magnetic field do, does is that it goes over here and then try to open up the magnetic field created by the electron. It opens it up and then affects, affects the electron. So let me make my diagram look nicer. Okay, let me make this sketch look nicer. So, in an atom, you have your spin. Um, that spin will now have electrons that generate a magnetic field. Those electrons generate the magnetic field. And so what you do is, you now apply your magnetic field, so which is referred to as B. This is my B. And uh, this other magnetic field here is BL. So BL is a magnetic field generated by the electron. BA is the applied magnetic field. And so when you apply the BA over here, only a certain amount of that magnetic field will go inside, which is referred to as the BE, which is the effective magnetic field. How much of the BE goes inside is a function of the BA. So if you have a lot of electrons surrounding a nucleus, if you have a lot of electrons surrounding a nucleus, very little BL. Uh, what is it? If you have a lot of electrons surrounding the nucleus, very little BE will actually reach the nucleus. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If you have a lot of electrons surrounding, very little BE will actually reach the nucleus. If you have fewer electrons, then you will have a lot of BE reaching the nucleus. Does that make sense? And so that's what makes the difference. That's what makes the difference. Now, when you have a lot of electrons surrounding you, let me go back to that diagram. Let's go back to this diagram. When you have a lot of so electrons surrounding that nucleus, we refer to that nucleus as being shielded. Does that make sense? When you have a lot of electrons surrounding the nucleus, we say the nucleus is shielded. And when you have few electrons surrounding the nucleus, the nucleus is referred to as being the shielded. Those are the languages we'll be using. Okay, which is what we have in the next uh, next slide. So over here, when we talk about a shielded nucleus, we simply mean a nucleus with a lot of electrons surrounding it. And the shielded nucleus is one with very few electrons surrounding it. Does that make sense up to now? So terminology. Now, the strength of the magnetic field, the strength of the magnetic field, which is uh, our BA, the applied magnetic field, or the BE, that strength of the magnetic field, uh, this is our frequency. That's the frequency over here. That's how the frequency increases. Okay. And so, the electrons that are shielded, the electrons that are shielded, we we'll refer to them as being upfield. Okay, we say those electrons are upfield. Upfield meaning in the upper section of the electromagnetic field. I will explain to you why we refer to it as upfield. Because the magnetic field, applied magnetic field, increases in that direction. So the frequency goes in this opposite direction. Let me change the color. So I will call this our applied magnetic field, the B0 or the BA. So that's how the applied magnetic field increases in that direction. In such that this you have a high magnetic field over here. That's why we refer to it as being up field. And down here you have a low magnetic field. That's why we refer to it as down field. Does that make sense? And so that up field is because in order to get this electron to in the nuclei to change spin, you will need to apply a lot of BA so that that BA will go over there and pull the BL apart, you know, to make the BA high. That's what we'll talk about up field. Are we good up to this point? 
Remember, the most important is because we want the effective magnetic field to actually reach the nuclei and cause the nuclei to separate. It's only when those nuclei separate, it now gives way for the radio frequency to come in. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's the meaning of being shielded and the meaning of being shielded. Now, I have a quick question. All the hydrogens, how many electrons are in the hydrogen atom? How many electrons are there in the hydrogen atom? One. But why is it that those hydrogen now appears in different regions of the electromagnetic spectrum? Okay. Now, my question is, let me put the question back. Let me put the question back. If you have a hydrogen connected to a carbon, and you have a hydrogen connected to an oxygen, are these hydrogens the same? Nuclear magnetic resonance will be actually able to distinguish between those two hydrogens. Okay? The question is how does it do that? The hydrogens they all have one electron. So you should expect the B effective to be the same because they all have one electron. But nuclear magnetic resonance are able to say that look, this hydrogen is here with oxygen and that hydrogen is there with carbon. How does it do that? Can anyone guess? Any guess? So again. Say that again. Well, you are kind of around that word. But there is one word I want to hear from you guys. There's one word I want to hear. Any idea? Why are these two hydrogens different? The hydrogen connected to a carbon and the hydrogen connected to an oxygen. Think about think about the real ones. Oxygen is more electronegative. Yes, that's what I was planning to hear, electronegativity. So how does electronegativity play here? What does it do? What, are you, what do you think about it? What does electronegativity do here? The electronegativity, because hydrogen is... Yeah, you guys know it, you guys know it. Hydrogen is more electronegative, right? What does it mean to be electronegative? It means you have you love pulling electrons towards yourself. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so because hydrogen is more electron negative, it will have the tendency of cooling the electrons that are protecting the nuclei of hydrogen and then exposing that nuclei. Does that make sense? It will be pulling the electron towards itself. I mean, it will do that more than carbon will do. Does that make sense? Now think about being upfield or being down to being shielded or being shielded. Now between those two hydrogens, which one do you think will be shielded and which one do you think will be shielded? Remember, shielded means you have a lot of electrons around you. The shielded means that you have few electrons around you. So between the OH and the CH, which one do you think will be more shielded? Does that make sense? So the OH will be shielded because the hydrogen is pulling electrons away from the nucleus of that H. And so that's how NMR actually will be able to distinguish them. Was that yes? So would you say it's a term like the lower due to the negativity of the like an atom that a hydrogen attached to the more um, <laughs> That's it. Does that make sense? So that's how NMR will be able to distinguish between those hydrogen. That's how NMR will be able to distinguish between those hydrogen. Is that okay? We are getting into NMR spectroscopy. Another example. Another quick example. Now, you have a carbon hydrogen for an sp3 carbon. And you have a carbon hydrogen for an sp2 carbon. Which of them will be the shielded? Which of them will be the shielded? Huh? Well, the shielded. Remember what the shielded means? Who will pull the electrons away from you? I think SP2 will be the shielded. Remember, SP2 means you have a carbon carbon double bond. Okay, and so that carbon carbon double bond will have the tendency of pulling electrons away from this hydrogen. Does that make sense? So, yes. 
for this will be the shielded and SP3 will be shielded. Does that make sense? SP3 will be shielded, the other one will be shielded. And so that's how we are able to, you know, be able to di distinguish which proton is which in a molecule with NMR. That's the way I want you guys to think about it, okay? Shielding and deshielding. That gives you a general idea. And so, we'll talk about the environment in which the proton is. Basically, that's what we refer to. That's the environment. We're talking about the environment. Remember the example we took? OH and CH. Those are the environment. Uh, let me use different inks so that I'll make it, I'll be using colors to explain stuff. So, we'll technically say the, the green proton is in a different environment from the blue proton. Okay? The green proton is next to an oxygen. The blue proton is next to a carbon. Those are different environments. Okay? And so, that comes down the notion of chemically equivalent proton. Uh, protons are said, remember, proton means hydrogen. Protons are said to be equivalent, chemically equivalent, if... They are present in the same environment. Does that make sense? If they are present in the same environment, we say they are chemically equivalent, and they will have the same NMR signal. Is that okay? So chemically equivalent protons have the same NMR signal. So one of your job now is to be able to distinguish those kind of protons. The number of signal you see in an NMR spectrum gives you information about the type of protons you have. That's very important. The number of signal you see in an NMR spectrum gives you an information of the type. When I mean by type of proton, I'm talking about chemical equivalent proton. Of the type of proton you will have. Does that make sense? So, for example, we have a bromo, a bromopropane over here. We have bromopropane. The type of protons that we have here, we have three different types of protons in bromopropane. We have this set of protons, we have this set of protons, and we have that set of protons. So, with three bromopropane, our NMR spectrum will show us three signals in the NMR spectrum. Three signals indicating that we have three different types of protons. It means we have three uh, chemically non-equivalent protons. Does that make sense? Three sets of protons. So, but within the CH3, these three hydrogens are chemically equivalent. Within the CH2, these two hydrogens are chemically equivalent. And within this other CH2, these two hydrogens are chemically equivalent. Now my question, why in uh, the blue protons different from the red protons. They are all CH2, but the blue protons are different from the red. Why? Yes. Exactly. Does that make sense? The blue protons are closer to bromine. Does that make sense? They are closer to bromine. That's why they are different from the, the red protons. And of course, the green protons also will be different because they are further away from bromine also. Okay? The red proton, they have the blue and the red as neighbor, so the environment is different. The green protons will only have the red as a neighbor, and then the blue will have bromine and the red as neighbor. So you all see that their environments are different. Does that make sense? Their environments are different, so they are chemically different. And so the NMR will be able to tell you that. The NMR will be able to tell you that. So one of your tasks is to be able to distinguish those chemically equivalent and chemically non-equivalent protons. That's very important. That's one of your job. Okay? And remember, the type of chemically equivalent proton determine how many signals you see in the spectrum. Yes? Let me let me write it down here. Mm -hmm. 
You answer the question. <laughs> you answer the question, right? They, they don't have the same technical environment. But, but now, the ability for you to distinguish between these two series soon would depend on the strength of your instrument. Does that make sense? The ability to distinguish between these two would depend on the strength of your instrument. If you have a really powerful instrument, then you will be actually able to distinguish them clearly. But if you have a weaker instrument, because there are some instruments that are only 50 megahertz compared to 1000 megahertz, you know, if you have a 50 megahertz instrument, it might be hard to distinguish between these two signals because they will be very close to each other at the point that they might appear as one signal. Does that make sense? But if you have like a 1000 megahertz instrument, and we clearly tell you that those guys are different. Does that make sense? But at least I'm happy that you know that they will most likely be different. So how many signals do you expect to see with that molecule? If you have a 1000 megahertz, how many signals will you see? We'll see about four signals. Does that make sense? We'll see about four signals. And that's what this slide is telling us. The type of signal, number of signals we'll be able to see. We've talked about the first guy already. We've talked about the first guy. We said the first guy will be three signal. Signal A, signal B, signal C. Okay. First one will be three signal. Signal A, signal B, signal C. Now look at the second one. The second one is saying we only have two signals. Can you understand why? You guys understand why the second one will only have two signals, right? Those two CH3, they have the same environment. And then the CH is in a different environment. So you only have two signals over there. The constant molecule is symmetric. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You can see that element of symmetry here. You can see that element of symmetry. Now, the third one, we have three signals. The third one, we have three signals. A, B, and C. You understand why, right? You cannot understand why based on the environment. They have different chemical environment. So the NMR will show you three signals. Over here, the NMR will only show you one signal. It will only show you one signal because of that symmetry over there. Okay. Down here, the NMR will show you two signals. Is that okay? These, these, and these are all the same. And they are different from this one. Is that okay, guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah life is good. LG. LG. And so on and so forth. Uh, let's look at this one. This one says it will give us two signals. These two will be the same. Okay, they will appear as one signal. And then these guys also will appear as one signal. You can clearly see that symmetry over there. You can clearly see the symmetry over there. Here you will only have one signal. Because these two hydrogens, we say, are chemically equivalent. Do you see how they are chemically equivalent? They are all connected to the same type of carbon, sp 2 carbon, and they are all neighboring the bromine atom. Of course, you know, it's neighboring the bromine, neighboring the bromine whatsoever. So, that's why they all give you just one signal. Yes, sir. Yes, they're going to be the wild, the two signals again. Two signals. Because if you put the symmetry here, you will see that this hydrogen, what you have below here is exactly what you have above there. Yeah. So the vertical group is the same as that vertical group, this hydrogen is the same as that hydrogen. Two carbons are different. These two carbons, they are different. Okay. They are different because this one is connected to that one. Okay. Oh, so sorry. we're looking at the environment of this photon. The environment of this photon is the same as the environment of that photon. So they give you the same signal. If the environments are the same, it gives you the same signal. If the environments are different, it gives you different signals. So with the benzene ring over here, you only have one signal. Because they all have the same environment. All these guys here, they all have the same environment. So that gives you only one signal. But once you now put a substituent, once you put a group, it changes the environment. 
In this case, you will see three signal. C, because they are closer to the NO3, will produce one signal. This one is the forest away from that NO, NO2. It will produce its own signal because the environments are different. I want you to be able to see that. And the A's will be the same environment. Because in this case, you can now break a symmetry like that. Okay. So that's what we refer to as chemical equivalent proton. That gives you the number of signal in the spectrum. Yes, ma'am. For this guy here. If I draw a line of symmetry here, you will see that this HC is neighboring the nitrogen and an HA, which is the same as this one. This HC also neighbors the nitrogen and an HA. Does that make sense? In uh, another word, we shall say the HC are orthogonal to the nitrogen, to the nitro group. So they are both orthogonal, auto position. Okay. So that's what makes them the same. And we'll say HA is in the meta position with respect to that nitrogen. That's why they are the same. And HB will be in the para, meaning opposite position to the nitrogen. Does that make sense? So if those positioning are different, it makes them different. Is that okay, guys? So determining the number of signals. Over here now, look at this structure. Over here, this structure will produce three signals. This structure will produce three signals. And I want you guys to see it and convince yourself that it will produce three signals. At least for signal C, it's clear. Okay, it's clear to everyone that signal C will be a signal on its own. But then A and B are not the same. A and B are not the same, and you guys can tell me why, right? Look at B. B is in the same side as a neighbor of BR. But A does not have a BR as a neighbor. So they are different, although they all originate from the same carbon. But because the environments are different, it makes them different. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because the environment are different, it makes them different. It makes them different. So B is closer to that B. They are all in the same size, cis. They are cis to each other. It makes it different from A. So you will observe three signals with this molecule. Is that okay, guys? Another example over here. I have another example. This structure, you guys will be able to observe five different signals in this molecule. You'll be able to observe five different signals. Now, signal E is clear, okay? Now, normally, you will probably expect that uh, HC and HD should be the same. Okay, you probably expect HC and HD to be the same. But it's the same reason. D is on the same side with chlorine. That's what makes it different from C. Does that make sense? D is on the same side with chlorine. That's what makes it different from C. And of course, same story goes with HA and HB. Because if I have to draw this... Technically, that HB also will be very close to that chlorine. We'll get into more details. We'll get into more details. Oh, yeah. I want you guys to now try this exercise. What we've done so far. Try this one and there's another one down here. Yes, try them, try them. I hope it works. I hope it works. Where's my phone? Let me try it myself. Before it tell me that it doesn't work. Yes, it does work. It does work. Oh. 
Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. It didn't work? No. Really? But why is it? It, it worked here. Yeah. Is the projector screen? Maybe. It doesn't even scan a lot or it doesn't open the page. I think it's the lighting. Yes. It just says A B C D. Those are the A B C Ds. But it looks uh, finish the match and then choose. Oh God, this is good to see. I'm very bad teacher. <laughs> So what's the answer for that one? Yeah. If you didn't sign the CR, make sure you get a copy and sign it. The class is not over. The class is not over. I see I have about seven or eight minutes. You know that I don't give my time up like that. You know that. You know that. But give me 30 seconds, I will use it. <laughs> so, what is the answer, guys? So, we all agree A is the answer, okay? A is the answer. It's just math. It's just math. This is uh, simple math. Uh, it would be one. Oh, what is it? So one point. Oops, I need a bigger ink. One point four t uh, divided by what is it? Sixty megahertz multiplied by three hundred and sixty megahertz. Does that make sense? So that the megahertz will cancel the megahertz and your answer will be Tesla. Is that okay? You do that and it gives you A as the answer. Next one. Yes, ma'am. It's correct. It's correct. It works. Next one. How many signals will you expect with that uh, the animal spectrum is that? Proton animal spectrum. That one H. One H stands for proton, okay? Whenever you see me writing one H, it means proton. So how many signals do you guys expect to have here? How many? One, two, three, four. Is that okay? So we expect to have four signals over here. We expect to have four signals over here. Huh. You guys already have uh, some multiple choice question correct. How many signals do you expect in the NMR spectrum of that guy? How many signals? Do we agree? Do we agree? 
Hey, who doesn't know why it's two? Do you see that symmetry over there? Okay. This CH3 is the same as that CH3. And this CH2 is exactly the same as that other CH2. So you will have these signals here. Does that make sense? So you only have two signals with this one. <coughs> How many signals will you expect to see in the proton NMR spectrum of the following compound? How many signals here? How many signals do you expect to see in the proton enema of this guy? So how many signals? Okay. So this guy will produce its own signal. This one will also produce its own signal. Now the blue protons will also produce their own signal. And the green protons will also produce their own signal. Does that make sense? So you have a total of four signals here. To, to here and here no 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 so technically this structure if we, we can draw out this structure this way and if you look at these carbons they already have four bonds around there okay so these structures are the same okay so yes we we'll only have four signals there is that okay guys yes that's good that's great uh, let me see oh I have another one <laughs> I have three minutes left <laughs> I have another one how many signals <laughs> Now, okay, she, she's asking a good question. That she's, she gets confused when she doesn't know when it says close to the bromine. Now, close means you are three bonds away. Does that make sense? Three bonds away is a normal range. Four bonds is what we call long range. But beyond four bonds, forget. In short, three bonds is a good, it's a good one, okay? Now, how many signals do we expect to have here? I will go with three. I will go with three signals, okay? Now, first thing, I have that my symmetry over there. Then I have this hydrogen. Nobody argues that one, right? Now, these hydrogens are the same. They are all in the upper phase. Does that make sense? And these guys are the same. They are all in the lower phase. So, the three signals will be, oops. So the three signals will be the blue, the green, and the red. Those will be the three signals. Let me see if I have another question. You guys should go. See you guys uh, Tuesday. Then I will, I will post the video, okay?